Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. I'm the social media manager of The Walking Dead. With me is Woody Tondorf, and also with me, our guest host, Chelsea Cook. Chelsea, how's it going? Hey! hey it's going great. It's exciting to be here. I've always kind of imagined in my head what it would be like, so it's really cool to actually see it in person. This is a full circle moment because you actually did our red carpet for the season 10 premiere, so... Now, here you are in the podcast studio, our giant podcast studio, million dollars, lots of money was spent. I hope you like the new upholstery that we put up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've never seen a studio this nice. Yeah, guys, there's like TV screens everywhere. They're just like doing slideshows of comics, Oblivion songs on The Walking Dead. Oh, no, that's quite enough coffee. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Yes, yes. (laughs) No, no, take take the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. We spared no expense. Uh, so on this week's podcast, we are actually going to talk about the new Walking Dead series. Last week, it got a title and a new trailer. So we have reactions to that. Uh, we're also going to do a season 10A retrospective. We're going to give some 10B predictions. We're going to interview Juan Javier Cardenas, who played wow. Dante. Yeah, I know. Can you believe we got him? You said we were going to get him last week, and I did not believe you. And here we are today. It is done. And then finally, we are going to ask fans who they think is not going to make it out of the cave. Sad question, but we're going to get some answers. We got a surprise trailer last week of the new Walking Dead series coming spring 2020, and it has a title. It's called The Walking Dead World Beyond. We've been waiting for a title for months. It was called TWD3. Uh, there were some rumors it was going to be called Walking Dead Endlings, but now we have settled on World Beyond. Guys, what do you think about the title? I'm actually really excited. I feel like the title was giving a hint, and I feel like if I don't know if I'm reading into it too much, but I'm just like World Beyond, so I don't know if that has to do with the kids wanting to find this like new world beyond or if it has to do with the new community that we've seen in Fear the Walking Dead and The Walking Dead because I kind of have a theory that like these kids are from this community and that they're going to be stepping out of that community. Wait, which community? The um, CRM community. CRM, that's their name. The, the three circles. The three oh, circles. Oh, okay. So, our, I mean, because we do get a look at the uh, at the helicopter that has, like, the, the stencil, and they have now gone – it looks like they're now accessorizing the logo across their different uh, – like, Yeah, the ma- these kids are wearing the logo. So I think it's, like, the community they're in, in Nebraska, I think it is, is yeah. – that is part of it. Wait, the kids were wearing the uh, yes. like yeah. the Mockingjay, but but yeah. also the Olympic rings yep. and the biohazard symbol. First trailer, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't. I I did not pick that up. Yeah. So I'm, that's why I'm just like, oh, these kids must be from that community, and they want to break out of it because it seems like they've been raised in it. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, is exciting, but uh, it kind of seems like a whole Carl turned back. Like, these kids don't want to stay in the house. <laughs> if I had closed my eyes, I would have thought that I was listening to, like, almost like a Friday Night Lights type show. Oh, yeah. Like, it's a lot more ethereal. Um, it just feels like the music cue has more hope to it. I, I really hope that uh, Virginia's community from Fear the Walking Dead is somehow tied to this. It seems like the world beyond is very much invested in kind of, like, connecting the different dots of this much larger uh, universe. Yeah, and uh, now we have the initials TWDWB. Rolls right off the tongue. It's it's <laughs> elegant in its simplicity. What is the hashtag that we're using? TWD World Beyond. We're just I think we're just calling it uh, Dead Bath and World Beyond. <laughs> Who's going to make a Bed, Bath & Beyond joke? That's fantastic. Oh, I think everybody who saw that title was kind of like, oh, shoot, how can I do a Bed, Bath & Beyond joke? Uh, and now we did it. I don't know. I'm going to say B-. minus. Yes. So moving on to The Walking Dead Season 10 A. Uh, we Ooh. had a lot going on. A lot was set up for a massive 10B we saw in the trailer. We saw some really interesting shots. We'll get to that later. Um, Chelsea, what was your uh, opinion of the first half of season 10? I thought it was really strong. I think it's one of the strongest seasons we've seen in a while, just like on, like, on the border of like new storyline because mm-hmm. we've been in the same storyline for a while. Right. So it's nice to see like all these new fresh takes and see how the groups are all evolving, especially being later into the apocalypse and how like they dealt with like the death of a lot of their friends and especially how that like can impact you. Because mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people really realize like they really haven't had much time to like mourn because yeah. they've been technically in war this whole entire time right. and just trying to like fight and make sure because they don't know if the whispers are coming back. But I've really liked it so far. And I'm one of those people that I always like The Walking Dead. But to me, this one's been like one of the most interesting and really just like 
crazy intense every single episode. Yeah, like time has moved so fast within yeah. cuz we were talking uh last week about the fact that uh within the span of like 24 hours, like two different whisperers get murdered in their jail cell. Like mm-hmm. I'm not sure exactly what the passage of time has been since like the beginning of 10A to to this part, but it seems like like a week maybe? Like it's been a lot has gone on. That's true. It took it's, like four episodes for Michonne to get to Oceanside. Yep, which reiterates the fact that, like, could we get a map at all to figure out how things are going? Maybe going off of last week where, like, Luke was like, hey, a library, let me get a book for jewels. Like, I try to picture, like, how many different, like, side quests that, like, Luke took them on. So, like, maybe it's just a day's journey, but he's kind of like, oh, is that a Baskin Robbins? Let's go check it out. You never know. It could have something. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong during a supply mission? All right, everything. I I think the writers (laughs) forgot to kill Luke. Um, (laughs) No! Come on, he had that like slow motion goodbye at Hilltop and I was like, he's dead. And then he's still alive. All we're missing is Luke having a heart to heart with one other character about how he feels that he's grown as a person and that his like, his circle is complete or something like that. And then like, oh, Luke is gonna die within the next like 15 minutes. But- oh my gosh, Luke is a more outgoing Eugene. He doesn't, oh, he actually ooh. has social like skills. That. And he's funny, he has like all the same thing. He's really smart, maybe not in the same way. But he's literally just a more outgoing Eugene. And it, we've had Eugene this long, so we can keep Luke, okay? Where were you last week when we were doing shot takes where you could just be like, uh, Luke is just spicy Eugene? <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, that is, that's fantastic. Um, all right, so let's get into, let's separate uh, 10A into some segments so we can talk about it, you know, more uh, digestibly. Is that a word? Uh, sure. It is now. Great. So now we're going to get into another edition of Ship Watch. <laughs> I think there there is no stronger, more mighty, more beautiful ship to me in the whole sea than the USS Donnie. Oh, I like Connie that ship. and Daryl made that ship sail forever, and I'm sure now that like the writers and like showrunners have heard all of us just like worshiping at the altar of Donnie, they've been like, hmm, interesting. Well, it looks like we're gonna have to kill Connie now. Like, wow. So you think Connie's gonna die? No, I, I actually don't think so. I think this is they've they've spent so much time working on this it would i i don't think that connie will die but okay. i am but i am planting my flag here saying that if anything happens to her i'll burn the building down okay. I, I again i don't know why we have to go down with it um you know what you did okay uh chelsea what do you who are you shipping from 10a well i am a really big like donnie shipper since like they first met you could tell that instantly there was some connection i don't know if it was like written like that or there was just a connection but it's so cute so it's that, and if I have to pick a different one, though, I'm going to go with Luke and his music books. Oh! <laughs> Not Jules. Sorry, Jules. <laughs> I love it. No, it's great. He's with his music books. <laughs> Did you see him when he read the book and he saw <laughs> yes. it? He was so, it was like he's never seen anything so beautiful, and it was just amazing. Find you a man who looks at you the way that Luke <laughs> looks at Rashomov. <laughs> um, I am shipping Alpha and Negan. Oh, tell me more about it. Well, we saw in, well, in the comics... Uh, we know that Negan tries to schmooze with Alpha, and uh, I, you know, maybe I'm not sure how it's gonna play out in the second half, but um, you know, we saw in the trailer Negan was in the woods, seemingly naked, and <laughs> maybe Alpha's a part of that. Maybe, maybe he's just taking a shower. I don't know what's happening. I, I haven't seen this 10B trailer yet. I, I confess, haven't? I haven't what? seen it. Look, Wait. we, we, <laughs> we <laughs> I know, but we. We, we've well established that I don't like to, I try to go into these things as fresh as possible. So like I haven't seen a single frame of a Star Wars trailer. I haven't seen like when Endgame was coming out, like I put on headphones going into the movie theater, which my wife did not appreciate when it's coming to 10B. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I want to go into it just not knowing anything. Wait, you don't want to watch the trailer? I, I would prefer not to. Okay. Well, then sorry for the spoiler. I, look, you're you're talking about a, a naked Negan stumbling through the forest. I mean, that, I mean, he might just have lost his pants. I don't know. Why Maybe. do I need to watch any more of that trailer? That gives me everything I possibly want. Oh, it's such a good trailer. All right. Well, you watched the trailer, right, Chelsea? Yes. Yeah. All right. So now to our next. Uh, we, this is just rapid fire segments. It's just coming at us fast. Uh, we're gonna go right on to Dunk Dunk. Alexandra's <laughs> listening to this somewhere, being like, "I left home for five minutes, and, you and guys they're just going to mockery. St- they're just going straight to segments. Ooh, Dunk Dunk." <laughs> The the number one dunked on 10A uh, achievement that I can think of is Alpha dunking on the entirety of the rest of the survivors. Sure. She, she sent a whisperer spy into Alexandria. No questions asked. That went perfectly. 
Uh, he ran rings around everybody, got everybody sick. She toppled a whole uh, tree onto King Top. She got Magna to start stealing things again. Like she has played all of the survivors off each other so perfectly. And all she had to do was like send a couple waves of walkers out, topple one tree and send one Dante. She has crushed it this season. And she's also gained like the mystical ability to move a giant horde of hundreds of thousands of walkers wherever the hell she wants to the point that they're somehow in some sort of cave complex. Yep. Moved into a cave. I guess is really big. I mean, the Bat Cave was huge and had interconnected things, and that was a fictional place, so, like, I, I can go with that. Um, my dunked on is I think Carol has been dunked on by her own, like, revenge. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's... You're saying, like, Carol's psyche is dunking on her? Yeah, it would be, yeah, her her mind is really dunking on her really hard. Uh, I mean, she's hallucinating, she's seeing things, and um, got a lot of poignant moments. We talked about it in last week's episode with um, Daryl and Carol, where Daryl's like, you know, you never left that boat. And uh, Carol's just motivated motivated by revenge so much so that she ran into a cave that her enemy, who definitely knows what's in that cave, like leads her right into the trap. And she's so motivated, she runs right in there, not thinking about anything. So I I don't know. It just it's hard to see Carol in such you know bad shape. And I really hope she pulls through. I mean, she's been through so much in the show. I, I really feel bad for her. I'm picturing Alpha running into the cave at the like at the end of the season finale, and then like seeing Carol just like hauling ass towards her, being like, "She really, she's gonna do it. She's oh. actually gonna go in the murder cave, <laughs> and she's bringing all of these A and B characters with her. Oh my god, this yeah. is this is Christmas. Okay, cool. This, this was my plan A. I had a B, C, D, E, F, and she went straight for. Okay, great. Uh, hoard in the cave. Uh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Nothing will go wrong, which is why she's not going to see Gamma coming, and that's going to be a whole thing. But yes. Does uh, Negan Duncan on the Highwayman count? Yes. Oh. R.I.P. Margo. <laughs> yes. Just like it's a yes. quick, it's a quick dunked on, but yeah. just like them just being mean. I hate bullies. Just yeah. being mean to Lydia the whole time, and Negan just swoops in and takes care of it in one hit. Yeah, he took the ball that was Margot's head and smashed it right into the glass, and by glass I mean wall, and uh, Margot's, uh, yeah, it was a slam dunk slash uh, murder. I was fine with getting ready to know the Highwaymen, but they were in the show for like four seconds, so I don't really feel bad for them or their plight, really. I mean, the only one I really cared about was the main guy. He seemed really nice. I was excited to get to know his character a little bit more, but um, now he's dead, and I don't really care about his other people, and, you know, who cares? All right, now, this ship is a sailing. And we're going straight into damn classic Negan. Damn classic Negan. One of the best delivered lines of the whole season. I agree. It, it's too good. I started laughing in my bedroom because it was just so funny. Beta with benefits. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm glad that they're able to still come up with clever lines for him because most of the lines he uses in the comics for Beta are very not safe for work. So, yeah, beta with benefits. Perfect. You get the message across. And uh, I just love how he's just like, so how does this work exactly? You bend in the knee. It's like people used to bend the knee for me. Yeah, it's the whole exchange. So amazing. Getting Negan back into the into the whispers and like just off the bench in general was just the the, the finest thing the show has ever done. Uh, my favorite Negan moment was just him like returning. Like Beta thought that he had left him to die with this pocket knife and he came back and he's like, where's my goddamn skin suit? Yes. And uh, it was great. And then he he went, he like by, didn't even look at Beta. He went right to Alpha. He's like, hi, I'm Negan. Like, he, and she's like, oh my God, this is this guy. I think Alpha is honestly playing Beta because she knows she can mm. and she knows that he'll do whatever. Yeah. But then there comes a time I see Beta like getting really close to like, I'm going to overthrow her. I'm going to overthrow her. So it almost like makes me think, are they going to do something where Ooh. Beta like turns his back on her Very possible. and like starts his own thing because like he sees Beta going off or he might kill Lydia, like, oh. which Ooh. I think would make Alpha really mad and then she kills him, which are just really crazy theories. But that, that's a pretty good shot take, though. I like that. That's pretty crazy. Um, there's some strong evidence that Beta might have been a country singer in a former life. Do you yes, buy into in that? Yes, in The Walking Dead. Yeah. I-, I like to. I want to. Yeah. I just really like when things are crossed over, especially like the tapes yeah. with Al and Abraham yeah. and Eugene being yeah, on them. Right? So I would really, really love that to be true. And I wish we get more backstory on how actually Alpha and Beta come together. Because mm-hmm. I know we got that one episode, the second episode, but I just feel like it wasn't enough to see how they actually formed an alliance. Because he knew at the end of that, I was like, they don't seem like friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's, like, really pissed. She, like, just killed his friend. And I don't know. It's interesting. I think you've got a good point, Chelsea, because the at the end of that episode, like, he cuts off his dude's face. And up until that point, like, the, the tactic for getting around walkers is just, like, smear yourself in, like, walker guts and blood. 
but you can see kind of like the beginning of them refining their method to be like, yeah, like we figured out how to walk around and like walk our guts and stuff. But like if we just like made some suits, that might be a little bit easier. And something that we could just, you know, it's fun outerwear and it's intimidating and, and people understand us. And so it's pretty good branding. I, I feel know. like if Nick had lived in Fear the Walking Dead, he probably would have figured out some version of the Whispers to start on his own. Or he would have found them or something. I don't know. I mean, he, he was covering himself in blood. He's like, guys, this works. Like, I mean, he took it a little too far. He's just like walking with the undead, almost died of like, you know, uh, heat exhaustion. But... That's a really that's a that's a fun one I think that we should play with later on in the uh, in the hiatus is uh, which what like legacy or fear characters do we think would line up with what faction if you all of a sudden put them in The Walking Dead? I agree, Chelsea. What uh, fear the Walking Dead character that's still alive would you bring to The Walking Dead if you could? I think about this question all the time. Good. And before she died, it was Madison. Now it is Strand. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. Because I I love his commentary. I I would just want to see him. With our groups, I think he would be best friends with Negan instantly. Ooh, I like that. And especially Magna, Yumiko, I think he would fit in with that group, right? Like there, it's the whole stealing thing, the whole got to be on our own, our own man thing. Definitely fits on brand for him. But I was thinking about this actually last night when Judith started recording all the stories and stuff, which I know is more of a comic book line, but I was like, she would be Al's little prodigy if they met. Oh, that would be, that'd be adorable and very deadly. Although to go to your strand thing, I would love to see Strand stuck in a room with Eugene because they both have just very particular ways of talking. And I just picture like the two of them just like running into each other and like all the things that like Strand would want Eugene to like fix his like gold plated iPad or something like that because like we get it, Strand, you were rich type thing. I need you to build me a jet, a G7. Like you want me to make you a a rigid airship, possibly a dirigible? You know, one of those metal birds in the sky. (laughs) Sorry. I'm, I'm just trying out these impressions right now. I have never tried these. Chelsea's looking back and forth being like, what have I gotten into? But yeah. Chelsea, how's your Eugene impression? My Eugene impression? I'm trying to think of something he would say. Just picture well, a word and then make it four times as long. All right, all right. Well, now I've gathered a graph of everything we're going to talk about in this podcast. Ooh. We're going to start from top to bottom. It's going to get us in and out quickly and efficiently. And nothing's going to fall down in the studio like... As also already done. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. This is a flawless. Brilliant. This is a very giant, big studio. Not only did she set the scene, it made sense to the character, and she also got to throw a little bit of shade at the podcast. That was that was the whole thing. I love it. You mean of this million dollar podcast studio? Yes, this What's million dollar. What's there to criticize? I mean, the There's LED no coats on the wall. The LED lights don't uh, circle the booth as much as I would like. I need more of a sparkly range of colors. Yeah, uh, I'd love to see just what uh, John and I guess June. I mean, I like June, but uh, I love <gasps> uh, John. Like, you'd have to bring both of them, right? But I would love to see John on The Walking Dead. Um, I think he would just bring a lot of flavor. I think he's the best part of Fear the Walking Dead right now. John and June as the new king and queen of King Top. Queen and Slim. Queen and Slim. Oh my God. <laughs> protest art uh that'd be great that would be great and and uh stick by me this with this i think that morgan would actually be a really good addition to the walking dead i think he would be like i think that i think people would really get into him i think they'd really like get his story i think he would just fit in really well wait wait, wait. You, you mean the guy who's always like preaching mercy and carries around that like donatello stick that got like that main series regular morgan on fear the walking dead i know it's hard to like picture him on the other show you but... want to bring him on to the og walking dead yeah morgan that's yeah. weird man what is wrong with you that's never gonna work all right but... all right fine they're two completely different styles morgan oh man you've had some You've had some bad takes in the past, Johnny, but th- it's never going to work. Why? How would Morgan fit into The Walking Dead? You're right. I guess I'll just drop it, and I guess I'm wrong. I'm sorry you had to see this, Chelsea. Yeah, it's it's, okay. He's usually way sharper than this. You know what's weird? I, I asked Lenny James one, like, one time, like, what for The Walking Dead characters would you guys bring on The Walking Dead? And funny enough, Lenny said himself, Morgan. That's strange. Which, you know, I think it's a little just like, he, you know, he wants to be on the OG show. Which... That makes sense. So Lenny James confirmed. So yeah. maybe I'm not so stupid Woody. <laughs> all right so now let's move on to the second half of season 10 which we haven't seen yet uh chelsea and i've seen the trailer i sent it to woody and he sent me a we'll lot do of it. middle finger emojis back mm-hmm. and um couple couple poop emojis great so can't wait to discuss all the things we saw in it <laughs> i've got how about this you you tell me what you saw in it but also try to slip in one or two fake details and i'll see if i can spot the things that aren't part of it great so the pokemon that were shown okay now come on now 
obviously there's Pokemon in the Walking Dead universe. I can absolutely pick. Uh, not unlike this Morgan moving from fear to Walking Dead garbage. I, obviously there's Pokemon in the trailer. All right. Yeah. Uh, other than Naked Negan, what we did see are the Return of the Shields from the season 10 premiere, except now they're at the um, entrance of Hilltop. So it looks like the Whisper War is happening. And Chelsea, are you, what are you most excited for? Not so much being excited, but having a panic attack is the right uh, word because mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I saw Beta jump over a gate. Not sure that's Alexandria or Hilltop because I confuse both of them now because sure. they look almost similar sometimes. Uh, yeah, I think they shoot one for one. But um, yeah, you're seeing Beta come into the communities. There, It looks like a whisper standing over Coco. With a knife, yep. Um, Everyone's I- trying to kill Coco. What is it about baby Coco that everybody wants to just murder this baby so much for? Uh, it's a very murderable baby. <laughs> Babies cost a lot to have on set. <laughs> but RJ is just like napping at home, like totally fine. But everybody's like, "Let's no, this is the baby we've got to murder. Yeah. You know what's interesting is you bring up that like Negan and Alpha would be going together. But when I saw Negan like in that trailer, to me, it seemed like he was being more like punished or tortured. Ooh. Like he was getting whipped in the back. Oh, I like that. I thought it was more of that because, like, the way Alpha was talking to him and the way, like, something happened. There's another spy in the camp. So I don't know if he's talking about Magna or he's going to throw someone else under the bus. You see, I haven't – I get episodes early. I have not seen that one. So I don't know what's going to happen with Negan. I was just going off the comic thing. But I like that a lot that he's getting punished. Uh, Yeah, maybe they do think he's a spy. Maybe. It makes total sense that – Beta was right when right off the bat, he's like, hey, this guy's kind of like the anti-whisperer. Like, he could not be louder. He could not be more brash. Like, he's so connected to the old world. Like, everything that is whisperer, like, Negan kind of stands against. Except he's just actually killing it as a whisperer right now. So, like, what are you going to do about it? I'm just excited for Maggie's return. I know we didn't see it in the trailer, but uh, it looks like she's definitely coming back this season. Uh, Chelsea, how do you think she'll return? I'm hoping it's one of those things like Carol when she went to Terminus that she comes in right when they need help Mm. and the cavalry comes in and it's like the big scene at Avengers when they all start opening the portals and she comes in with a huge like Commonwealth army or some army if it's not Commonwealth. I'm hoping she comes in. She has big cavalry. We see Cal and like Eduardo and a couple of the other Hilltop people we haven't seen in a while (laughs) that they're all with her. Those are just dreams. Um, But yeah, I think she's going to come in packing. And she's going to come in because she got, like, a radio transmission or something. Someone got a message to her finally. She's heard about all the deaths, and she wants to come back. Because I feel like that's the only reason she would return. It's because she knows her home's in trouble. I love that. What do you, what do you think? If Maggie doesn't show up with the Commonwealth, I think that's more surprising than if she, than if she does. I don't know. I, I guess if you if you don't read the books or if you're not like up on how this stuff is working, like you, it would probably be a surprise that she'd show up with this whole other thing. I, but, Chelsea— Johnny always says, every single week, never misses, if we talk about Pamela, he's like, oh, that's... uh, Georgie. Yeah, if we talk about Georgie, that's Pamela from the Commonwealth. Do you agree that this is, like, a Commonwealth person, like, in disguise? Or do you think that she is actually, like, the commander-in-chief of the Commonwealth folks? Or is she just some person who hates spoken word? I'm hoping it's tight end because it just doesn't make sense not to with everything set up. But we've seen The Walking Dead a couple times take storylines and kind of turn it. Yeah. But it's just really hard to tell what they're going to make a comic book line and what they're not because it's different all the time. We've seen it like Glenn's comic book death, but the spikes were totally different. The pikes, yeah. whatever. They were all different than what the comic books were. So it's really hard to say. But I feel like Commonwealth is such a huge storyline. It's like how do you not – go there if that is the next step. And we're here at the Whispers. What's next? Well, that's next. Again, I don't know the information. I don't know if it is Pamela or not, but it makes sense because when we met Georgie, this was, I think, now in the timeline seven years ago, and she had two guards with her, but they were just dressed in normal clothes. So I think it's very conceivable that in that seven years, and she probably already had a community. You know, she already had, she had an entire blueprint she was willing to just give the copy of to someone else. So she knows how to build like a running community. She has guards. And I think over those seven years, they just gather resources. The guards eventually take up armor. She eventually, you know, trims her hair a little bit and, you know, becomes governor. And yeah. But I could also see that being a thing where like with uh, with Georgie and her guards, like you wouldn't it would be weird if this like nice middle aged lady in a van shows up with these like two stormtroopers like that would be that would be strange. You'd basically be saying like, hey, I am 
obviously I'm a big deal. I've got these like geared out dudes. So to like have a couple folks who like just look like regular old survivors is probably like a better way to like go in like clandestinely. Yeah, yeah. that's totally a word and I really nailed the pronunciation of it. But you get what I'm saying. Like she's being all covert like whereas when she brings them back she'd be like, "Oh no, actually we're like we're big fucking deals and here's all of our like civilization." Yeah, I mean I like I said I think we were seeing the beginnings of Commonwealth by her appearance uh, in season 8 and then now I think she's built it up and has guards with armor and I think we're going to see her again in season 11. Yeah. That's my guess. I don't uh, otherwise why does she exist? Who who wins in a fight? The the cool Commonwealth stormtroopers who we've seen in the books or these like Clearly evil CRM like shooter guys Ooh. who we saw in the World Beyond thing. Or sidebar, like, are they the same? Who's to say they're not the same person? Right. So f- they say so CRM is an acronym, obviously. I think the C stands for Commonwealth. I think the M stands for Monument, which is one of the code names for the new Walking Dead series, World Beyond. Uh maybe that was the name I think that might have been the name of the college or something they're from. Sure. And then the R is Rick Grimes. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> I it, the R better be tied to Fear the Walking Dead. I swear to God. I mean, it would be it would be rude if they kept Blessed Fear out of it because they have way too much fun for anybody to deal with. It's true. It's true. What if the letters are all mixed up and it means My Chemical Romance? But <laughs> 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 uh, that is that is the crossover yeah. no one saw coming, <laughs> but was right in front of us the whole time. The Walking Dead season eleven, Black Parade. It's all happening. W- I mean, would you not watch it? I'd watch it. I'd watch the hell out of it. Yeah. I'd watch the hell out of that. All right. Um, so, how do you guys think season ten is going to end? You think that the whispers are they going to be through are we still going to be fighting them in season 11 are we getting commonwealth what's happening i for the end i'm thinking we're going to see the whisper storyline end mm-hmm. for sure okay. um again i feel it's been too intense this next episode for the beginning of the mid-season finale is way too intense for it not to end at the end because if so you built all this up for nothing mm-hmm. whereas like all at war we saw it very slowly build up it was never this fast um, I'm thinking we're going to see a couple big people go. Uh, I have predictions on a couple big people. like Name them. Uh, King Ezekiel oh. and yep. Rosita are top two. I think uh, won't be making out alive. Yeah. Even though that's really, really sad and I don't want to see them go. I just think we always have one person. And especially in a war like this, there's no way they don't die. Yep. Someone on Twitter said that it's possible that they just thought maybe Ezekiel gets Andrea's comic death where she's like dying sick in the bed after she got bit and everyone like has a like you know says goodbye and everything like that do you think that's possible for Ezekiel like he'll succumb to his illness or do you think he'll get like bitten in war like or like killed in war what do you think's gonna happen I'm hoping it's a nice slow death like My- Grace <laughs> no- <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> what well, how is that a fast? nice slow death you, well, I, I think <laughs> like, you'd want death to be fast I don't think you'd want to be mean- like I'm dying it's like well you got a few more weeks left buddy well, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, like, he goes in a sleep type thing. Like, the cancer takes him, and he doesn't die by a walker. Uh, what do you? Who do you think is not making it out of season ten? Ezekiel's a goner. I okay, mean, that, that dude is that dude is dead. Um, let's just go nuts. Uh, Rosita, she's got that Selena money. So long, she's gone. Um, Gabriel, because he died in the comics, and I think he is now kind of got to a leadership point of like, what have I become? I just murdered this dude. I wear a really cool hat. I stared into a, a, a bonfire with Rosita. What, what more can you do after that? Like that's the tops. Um, so I think Gabriel's gone. Um, Alpha's gonna die. Beta's gonna die. Gamma's gonna die. Aaron's gonna die. <gasps> oh, don't you, you saved- dare, sir. Here's here's the thing. I am a I'm a very big Aaron fan, and uh, I audibly fanboyed out for the Mace Hand. He's awesome, and like the journey that he's gone on now, I love the relationship between him and Gamma. The way that he's like going back to his old uh, Alexandria Scout self. I don't want any of these characters to die. Also, I think sweet sweet Jerry it never makes it out of the cave. I don't want that to be a thing. I just think that's probably how it's gonna go down. Well, as you saw in the trailer, uh, actually, you didn't see, uh, Jerry was having some troubles in the cave. Oh. I'm not indicating anything. I'm but just saying in the trailer. But do we see Jerry out of the cave? No. No! <laughs> no! 
I'm not saying he dies. He, he may not. I think he's going to survive. We'll Ugh. see what happens. Who knows? I do. Okay. All right. On to... <laughs> I can't look at you for these podcasts because I just... I will read too much into your eyes. See, you think my poker face is, like, really bad, but it's actually really good. Like, sometimes I, like, egg you on knowing that you'll think I'm, like, giving something away, but I'm not. And maybe sometimes I'm not giving something away, and I am. What a complicated... What a complicated game we play, Johnny. Yeah, dating me is really fun. Real, real quick before we jump on to our special guest, and I think this will segue nicely into it, uh, who else was just really kind of flabbergasted at the way they just did a, a fun little twist on the Dante character? Like, Chelsea, did you see that coming? Well, once he killed Sadiq, I kind of figured they were just going to murder him. <laughs> hey, <laughs> wait a minute. There's something not quite right about this guy. Uh, oh. No, well, hmm. I mean, as episode one, season 10, there's something wrong with this guy. Yeah. yeah. You don't just introduce a doctor like that. And, <laughs> and especially, he's just weird, man. He's like every good psychopath. He's he's very charming. I, I study psychology and sociology. And like the way they actually built him up is just like a classic psychopath. And you can tell he's just like really weird. Um, and something wasn't right. So I figured something bad was going to happen. And then as soon as we started seeing that episode and showing a lot of Sadiq, I was like, oh, yeah, we're seeing too much of you. That's not good. Yeah. Um, he had like two heart to hearts with Rosita in one episode. Like, two heart to hearts with any character in Walking Dead is usually like the probability of death goes from like green to orange. Mm -hmm. But red being death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of Dante, he's not a real person. He's actually played by an actor, Juan Javier Cardenas. And I had the pleasure of talking to him, and we're going to hear that right now. Our next guest is an incredible actor and musician known for his roles on SWAT, Snowfall, and The Walking Dead, where he played a double agent doctor named Dante. That's right, is Juan Javier Cardenas. Juan, thank you so much for coming on Talk Dead to me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, now, we're recording this on the Monday after your character Dante's death on The Walking Dead. Uh, you were on Talking Dead last night. Uh, what's been the last like 24 hours been like for you? Uh, it's it's been a trip. Um, it, going on the Talking Dead was it was a really great experience because it was one of the first times that I was able to kind of verbally kind of speak out about uh, about the character. So it was like a big weight that was lifted because um, it, it's it's such a it's such an exciting uh, crazy secret. Uh, all the stuff that was revealed in seven and eight, and of course we got done filming, or I personally got done filming back in the summer. So I was kind of holding oh, on wow. to all this secret knowledge for months and months. And it's a really hard thing when I'm surrounded by so many friends and family that are uh, fanatical about the show. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really hard thing yeah. to kind of keep tight-lipped about it. You said on Talking Dead that you weren't even aware of Dante's like full story arc uh, until pretty much right before you started filming. It was definitely one of those moments uh, uh, very much like a quintessential, hey, welcome to the Walking oh. Dead moment <laughs> as, a, as an actor. <laughs> so uh, what happened was is that um, c coming into this season, uh, coming into this season, um, I – the information was really parceled out to me, you know, on a, it was kind of a very much a need to, you're on a need to know basis. So when I actually showed up to the first day of work, essentially all I had the information that I had to use was the information that was given in that first episode where I first appeared. I didn't have that many right. scenes. I had, I had small establishing scenes where you, where you establish, where you meet the character Dante and he has that meeting with Sadiq in the infirmary along with Coco with the baby. And uh, I, I, of course, like I went back to the source material to Robert Kirkman's uh, amazing series. And I literally I read every compendium, you know, I went back and analyzed mm -hmm. the character of Dante in the source material. And I really did feel that I had a, a quite quite an established grasp on who this person was, what his role in uh, in the hilltop in the comics or what his role would be in Alexandria. And I walked on set mic'd up you know marks were placed on the ground <laughs> met avi nash had a great conversation was gearing up going over loosening you know stretching out a little bit before we were about to do the scene and i got that tap on the shoulder from greg nicotero the executive producer who was directing the uh the first, <laughs> first episode and he's like hey man um let me let me get you has anybody spoken to you about kind of what you're going to be doing this season and i go no uh but uh you know i've read this and that and i feel like i'm really kind of uh, prepared, you know, I, I understand kind of where I'm going right now. So I'm pretty good, feeling pretty good about it. And he goes, yeah, why don't you step off set for a second? Take a five minute walk with me. <laughs> and he, oh my gosh. And he revealed uh, the general arc of, of what the character was. And, and, and he revealed all the ulterior, ulterior motives of, of the character and, and really the true face of, of who this person was like in about a 
10 minute pep talk uh, outside on the streets of Alexandria. We stepped away for a while um, and uh, and it was fantastic. But I say this every time I relay that story, I always say that at that point, um, what I felt my first uh, my first feeling once hearing the news was a, a huge sense of invigoration and actually really excitement. Because what that means really? is that is that I was given a really singular, lucky opportunity to really create a new character, a, a, its own unique kind of interpretation of the character Dante, paying homage to the source material, but really making this its own creation that would stand on its own um, for an audience. And uh, you don't always get that when you're doing uh, when you're doing interpretations of original work, you know, or adaptations, which is what The Walking Dead is. You don't usually get that. You know, so I feel actually very lucky that I got that chance. And yes, it, it made me, <laughs> obviously, I had about, you know, 10, 15 minutes to kind of process it, go back into the scene and kind of reanalyze beat by beat everything that I was saying in that scene and trying to understand, okay, with this new knowledge as an actor, with this new given circumstances, how does that change what I'm saying in the scene? How much of this is legitimate? How much of the language that I'm using, is this real? Or, you know, is Dante believe what he's saying at this moment? How much of this is the cover? How much of this is for the mission? And how much of it is real? It's interesting because you are acting as a guy who was acting. Like the only, the worst thing you would do is just make like an inappropriate joke. But secretly you're like, oh, I've held someone's eyes open clockwork orange style while all their friends <laughs> got beheaded. So is it like facial expressions? Like I was trying to go back and like find, you know, moments where you might've like had some tells. You, you you hit the nail on the head uh, by way of like what I what I'm gonna get a kick out of and what I hope people do is that after the reveal of last night what I hope uh, audiences do is that if they have the chance they'll possibly go back and revisit uh, the storyline the Dante Sadiq storyline and, and and kind of analyze every scene now with you we, now that we know the present information of what he was there in the first place it would be really fun to revisit those scenes and and see kind of what transpires between them and try to kind of analyze, see if there are tells or if there are moments and, and really leave it up to the audience to really decide whether how much they believe on face value, what's going on, what's, what's, what's going on at the surface of the conversation and how many layers underneath there is like that, that, that I think is going to be really fun to do. And more to your point about how do you go, go about like attacking material like that as a performer, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's really, it really is moment by moment. It takes a lot of collaboration um, with you as the actor along with, with the writers and with the creative team and with the directors that it's working on each episode when you go into each scene and you have those conversations. I had those conversations many times with all the, with the myriad of really fantastic directors that were on set. And of course with Angela Kang trying to understand, okay, let's think about these beats as they're coming along. How much of this is real? How much of this is him kind of overextending himself, trying to be overly familiar with people? How much, you know what I mean? How many of those comments right. are basically somebody who's wearing a mask. It's kind of like this, like an alien, an alien person in this alien world trying to, formulate what he believes to be the personality of a gregarious uh open and kind of overly familiar person because that's what that character at that moment is assuming is necessary to ingratiate himself with the people around him and where where does he as like a counterintelligence spy where is he kind of tripping and stepping over the line and think about it this way that mm -hmm. this is a person that prior to his arrival uh in alexandria has been living within the incredibly dark antisocial kind of messianic cult of whispers out there where you know which is a very dark worldview of these people that are not interacting with each other in any kind of semblance of a normal modern society so to have somebody that can be that compartmentalizing and pluck him out of that environment and put him in this environment where he has to essentially convince people that <laughs> that that he's that he's a normal person that they've that they've that they've plucked out of uh, out of danger and he can adapt. That's a really tough thing to play. But like I said before, as a, as a performer, what you can do is you just do you just do moment by moment and you make choices. Speaking of choices, I know that they left some of Dante's backstory vague on purpose. When Father Gabriel uh, came to him and, you know, Dante's uh, final moments, he said, D you know, like, were you like, did you go to war? Do you have a family? And, you know, your character says, does it matter? I'm going to ask you that same question. Does it matter? Do you think his background matters? I, th there's kind of two things in that where I think about, and uh, I'll, I'll answer the, you know, does it matter? What I love about kind of talking about these kind of questions about the backstories that was established by Dante and those conversations, those private conversations with Sadiq, and then later on with Gabriel, is that I know what I think is true. 
And that was stuff that was useful to me and to what I did. I, I kind of tease around when people ask me about it. What, what's the veracity of these things that he mentioned about his past? How much of it is true and how much is not? And it's something that I do like to, to keep kind of close to the vest because in a way, I think when you have that kind of unknowing sense as an audience member to really second guess everything and to not understand how much of it was true, it, it tells two stories. It's, it's a frightening and horrific kind of character arc if, if all of it is true and it's possibly even more terrifying if none of it was true. You know, it tells two very different stories, right. unnerving, you know, an unnerving sense of that you're never on full ground of understanding who this character was, right? So that's the first thing. And then at the same time, I think when he says that does it really matter, that's an extension of, I think, the whisper philosophy of saying like everything, everything, the more that I think about the, the whisper cult and, and why people are attached to it is that it it erases any kind of um ownness of like personhood you know the whispers what i mean by that is that right. if you're in the whispers you know you're no longer a person you you know you're stripped of your name you're stripped of your history those so you lose yourself in the herd you know you're no longer a person anymore so all the things that make us special or unique or wanted or cared for by our friends and our family around us is all the stuff that makes us unique you know our backstories, mm -hmm. you know, if we do have children, all that stuff makes us who we are. In the whisper worldview, that's that's all a facade. You know, we're we're animals at the right. at the very end. You know, everything that we build up, these social structures, these family relationships, all that will ultimately crumble. So, with him saying that, that's a very, I think, that's absolutely um, the like a thesis statement on the whisper philosophy. It doesn't matter. Do you personally think that Dante had like medical experience? Like some of the moments we had, like he he diagnosed someone as having the butterflies when they were like dying of this like water poisoning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, wait a minute, is he actually a doctor? Or does he just wear the coat? And like when he was getting initiated, he's like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm a doctor. And they're like, oh cool. What I'll say to all that is that there are there are skills and abilities that no matter how good of a of a spy you are, there's not stuff that you can pull out of a hat. You know what I mean? There's uh, you know, mm -hmm. and that's that's a that's a fun clue for audiences when they're trying to parcel out how much of his story is real how much of when he when he expresses kind of close kind of emotional things to Sadiq you know how much is that real how much was were we seeing a little bit of an interior life of Dante or you know how much there are things that you can't fake and I and I think those right. moments obviously he does you know he he does he stitches up Carol you know uh, he he mm -hmm. can take over for Sadiq in in medical situations you know there there is an implied sense that yes he has he has medical training to what extent was it in the <laughs> army was it not ah that's part of the fun of it right episode eight at the top when you see him being sent off to war uh, by Alpha she mentioned she goes through the list of all these talents and abilities that she saw in him and knew him because I'm assuming that Alpha right. knows everybody in the in the Whisper cult more than they know themselves. And that's part of the reason why she chose specifically him. She's like, you have abilities and talents that aren't available in other people here and all my other foot soldiers. That's why I'm choosing you. Also, a small thing, uh, but what I liked about the last episode is you see him speaking Spanish, for mm -hmm. instance, Rosita. You know, that's not something that people yeah. think. But <laughs> it does, but it adds a three-dimensionality to the character. You get a glimpse of, you, you get all these little easter eggs things you know where you could for fun if you wanted to try to piece together who he was before he found himself in the whispers or who he was pre-apocalypse you know you could there's a lot of stuff to mine there the spanish speaking if people don't know you come from central florida yeah and I come, yeah, uh, from around, that area, around orlando. orlando right yeah and uh you had a mother who correct me if i'm wrong she was a architect in puerto rico and your father was a painter wow yeah that's that's that pretty cool that's pretty close yeah yeah no that's yeah my Close. Mother, my no, but, well, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, absolutely. My father was. Okay. My father did paint. Yeah, you're in the ballpark. You're good. Did paint. Yeah, Paintings did. Did. were happening. And my father. My There's father, paint involved. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> there were art supplies. So uh, my my yes. family, okay. in, my family in an interesting kind of way does have, um, they have a, uh, they have a bit of the, a bit of the arts in them. Um, and particularly in my two right. parents, particularly in the visual arts, both my, both my mother and my father um, are excellent, uh, really wonderful visual artists. And so since since the time that I remember in our house, it was always a thing that was understood that the, the arts in general are something to uh, to embrace. And, and it's it's a good thing to be surrounded by by art. And it, and it really it it feeds you. Um, so since the get go, since the get go, I was always really encouraged by my parents to explore different kinds of 
different art and different kinds of mediums. Uh, but yeah, my mother, my mother uh, studied architecture at the University of Puerto Rico, where she met my father, who was studying architecture at the University of Puerto Rico. But then he left because he oh, nice. he, he he would tell me he's like he hated being told that he had to erase everything. He's like, I hate that racing. I don't want to erase <laughs> anything. So he dropped out, and he actually went oh, into wow. my father. My my father actually went into medicine. My father was an ophthalmologist uh, for many years, and we lived in. Uh, oh, okay. I grew up in I grew up in Orlando, or you know the suburbs around Orlando. And uh, yeah, my father is Cuban, my mother is Puerto Rican, and uh, it was uh, mm-hmm. it, it's it's always it's always great to get an opportunity to inject a bit of uh, a bit of your a, a bit of your personal culture into mm-hmm. whatever roles you're 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 playing. Because of course, what that does is that it makes you feel a bit more closer in those moments when you're when you're acting with someone and you get to do that. And so, for both me and Christian, we talked about before we got this uh, before we got the final script for the dialogue. Um, it was both important. It was important to both of us to to be able to do this, and so we were given actually a lot of leeway uh, with with Angela with the creative team about picking and choosing uh, which bits of dialogue we wanted to drop into Spanish and and how much we wanted to do it in English, yeah. uh, do in English. So e- even in a small little scene like that, we were given so much leeway and we were given so much trust by the creative team uh, to come up with something uh, on our own. That's something I, I really appreciate because again. You know, I think television and, and film is is really a collaborative art. So when you get moments like that, it just uh, resolifies. You know, it uh, it reaffirms basically that that tenant about it, which I which I think is really important about the process. Well, I know that you went to Florida for undergrad and Florida State for your master's, right? Yeah, you know everything, man. And at uh, <laughs> and at Florida, you said that's where you learned the machinations of uh, production, essentially. So does that. How does that affect how you see things on set? That's right. Yeah. While uh, my 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 undergrad experience was was a very generalized kind of like four year university experience when you when you go and you study at at a school like that, um, basically, absolutely, you right. get you you run the full gamut as far as studying all the different kinds of like uh, um, all the facets of production along with acting. And then when I went to graduate school, it was a smaller conservatory that was really based on actually performative acting. Of course, it was a very very acting school. But yes, in my undergrad. Um, of course, we had to do scene design and lighting design, and you had to do you study makeup, and you had to do costumes. At least introductory courses, so that. And I think the I think what what's wonderful about that is that from the get go, you get an appreciation for uh, the process and uh, uh, the amount of work it takes uh, to build what we eventually see on camera or what we see on stage. You get, you really gain an appreciation for the for the professionalism and for the artistry of all the the technicians that are behind it. That they basically provide you the world with which you can do your job, you know, and really live in it. And um, I've I've always ever since I started, since I began working in television and film, that that appreciation obviously is carried over tenfold because the amount of people that uh, that are behind the camera in creating the universe of of The Walking Dead. Um, it's, it's really amazing what they do. And it's really something that I, I, that I hope the audience members can really, really appreciate. I mean, just obviously the, the the most fun kind of aspect to it is what we talk about is all the creature effects. You know, one of the, the best moments of my life is when I got to walk through the kind of like hall of horrors, uh, creature workshop at the Walking Dead Studios (laughs) And to see all the busts yeah. on the wall of all the heads and all the different faces and to see how they – see how the plastics are made and stuff like that to create all these effects. So much of what the work uh, – the work that's done as far as creature effects on The Walking Dead is is practical makeup effects. You know, there, there's – there's mm-hmm. of course, there's CGI when it's necessary, but so much of it is done in the old school way of monster movie making and the talent level is – I mean, it's bar none. I tell I tell my friends and family this. I go, I'm telling you. I was there. I got I got to see it, and the the it looks as good in real life as it does on camera. It truly does, you know. In the show, it did seem that Dante and Sadiq, even though Dante would kind of um, sort of like make you know kind of pretend that they had like this like you know secret romance or something as like a joke, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it did seem they did have some kind of chemistry. Does that still play into like your own ideas of maybe what was going on, and maybe not on the page, but? you know, on the screen. I try to think of it in this way, that playing a character like Dante as an audience member, uh, I would encourage people to look back on those scenes and think, okay, this is somebody who has a secret. He's trying to portray himself in a different way. Let's let's listen to what he's saying and try to dissect it in this way that look at look at who he's talking to. 
in the moments when he is speaking mm-hmm. and try to observe who else is in the room at the time. How much of what he's saying oh. is for the benefit of other people, other people who might be listening. Right. You know, he's trying to play this role at all times. So then look at that and then compare it to moments where there isn't an audience or where there is no need to present like a different face. And what yeah. I will what I will speak upon the 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 relationship with Sidique and Dante and the veracity and how true it was or how true it was at certain moments is that I, I always think back to those final moments of episode seven where uh where he's, you know, extinguishing uh, Sadiq's life. And they're in that Ugh. moment together in that room. And he says to him, he says, I didn't want this. Not like that. Not this. Dante knows absolutely that, you know, Sadiq is not, you know, he's not walking out of this room alive. You know, saying that, saying that to him isn't for the benefit of anybody. It's not a cover. You know, there's no need for him to say anything in those moments. But that's something that he says uh, in the moment, I, I I take that as a true as a true moment because it's not for the benefit of other people; it's for the benefit of the person yeah. that's right in front of them. I can't wait to rewatch these episodes now and be like, "Wait a minute, what does he mean?" When we shot uh, uh, episode seven, uh, specifically in the scene the the, the killing of Sadiq, uh, I had a great conversation with uh, Michael Cudlitz, the director. Um, yeah. Uh, prior, while we were working those those final moments, you know, <laughs> and we came to this to this great kind of conclusion that. In those last moments where Dante is speaking uh, to Sadiq, and he's speaking about what 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 is it that makes Alexandria special, and it's 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 a, it boils down to the people uh, because it's the willingness of people to help each other, it's the willingness of people right. in really dire situations to to not do what's expedient or what's easy, which is to be cruel and to to tear at each other, but work together. And that's why Alexandria works. It's not this theoretical idea. It's people making that conscious decision to be better people. And uh, mm-hmm. as 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 he's speaking it, and he's he's getting closer and closer to Sadiq. We have to remember that if Sadiq <laughs> was not so damn perceptive, and was able to in that moment <laughs> see him out. It's interesting to to it's interesting to imagine how the rest of that scene would have played out because it's unexpected. You know, I don't believe that. Dante entered that room, understanding that this was going to be the night that Sadiq was Sadiq was going to die. I don't think so. Right. And me and, and me and Cudlitz, what we were talking about is saying that we we should take this moment of him when he's talking about Alexandria, about people working together. It's kind of like when when you've been ruminating on something. If you're if you're trying to work something out in your head, you know something you've been thinking about, something that's kind of been affecting you. Sometimes. You get moments of clarity when you actually speak things out loud for the first time. There's there's kind of that phenomenon mm-hmm. where you if you when you speak when you put your words you know to speech for the first time and you hear them out loud kind of hit back to you. It, it, it gives you a bit of moment of clarity. You know, and it makes them more real to you. And and what I think is in those moments, little by little, we get a glimpse of somebody, in this case Dante, speaking these words for the first time and kind of understanding it and and having it possibly hit him in a way that as he's saying it out loud, he's coming to an understanding that there is something here and he's coming to it. Right. He's coming to it piece by piece. So Juan, what's next for you? I was able to work on the show 911 Lone Star that shoots out in Los Angeles. That'll be uh, premiering. I did an episode with them that'll be premiering in the new year. So look out for that. That's a really different, yeah. <laughs> much nicer guy <laughs> than Dante. Like, okay. You know, so I don't so, know. Fool me once. Yeah, I know exactly, exactly, exactly. I don't, I don't rip <laughs> off my face mask at the end of it. Right. Uh, for the moment, I'm enjoying a bit of downtime with my kids and my wife and, uh, and relaxing a bit and enjoying it. So that's what I'm doing now. That sounds great. Well, you're really talented and we're really lucky to have had you on The Walking Dead. Um, I'm sad to see your character go, but, you know, I think you added a lot more depth to the character of Dante. Uh, Even though he's different from the comics, you really, you know, fleshed him out and is one of the best running storylines of season 10. So all of the fans, even if they're mad at your character, (laughs) uh, everything I've seen on Twitter as like the social media manager, everyone's very positive about your performance and everyone is really bought in. So um yeah you're you're awesome so thank you so much for coming on to the podcast i appreciate it thank you so much i i had a blast thank you very much for talking with me and uh yeah i i appreciate everything you're saying uh particularly the people that have gotten messages from from like you know somebody from the ukraine <laughs> or brazil oh, writing wow. me. yeah somebody writing me from like brazil tw uh twd fan from brazil you know girl 86 saying uh 
I gotta tell you, I hate you so goddamn much, but that probably means that you're good at your job. So <laughs> good job, buddy. That's great. But, and yeah, exactly. it's a it's a global show. I mean, yes. you'll you'll meet people all over the world. Uh it's it's awesome. Uh tell the people before we go where they can follow you on social media. I'm on Instagram. It's at Juan Javier Cardenas, uh, just my full name. And uh yeah, uh find me there and uh thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it's uh, it's appreciative to know that uh, the work that you do means something to people. So uh, thank you so much. Absolutely does. All right. See you, man. Thanks. All right, man. Thank you. All right. And that was our interview with Juan Javier Cardenas. Uh, you know, I really like what he said that, you know, Dante's character was kept pretty vague. Um, Chelsea, what do you think about Dante? Do you think that him and Sadiq might have had something going on, or do you think that maybe he didn't want to kill Sadiq? I don't know. What was your lasting like take on him? Well, I mean, he even did mention to Rosita that I this wasn't a part of the plan. I like Sadiq. He was never supposed to go. And you could tell that he genuinely did like Sadiq, that yeah. he became friends with him after. And then, but I think he's just like Alpha got into his head too much that he had to do this. And in any way possible, he was going to save Sadiq at least from it. But... It was just one of those things like, oh, no, I screwed up. And then he realized that now he's going on this rampage. Like, oh, I have to cover Zita. I have to, like, clean up my entire mess so I can stay here. Because I would like to know, like, later down the line if he, like, actually, you know, got to see the community more, if he actually would have changed. Now we're going to get into Woody's favorite segment, my favorite segment, and Chelsea's soon-to-be favorite segment, fan voicemails. Yeah! Yay! Yay. All right. So uh, this week we asked fans who they think, and this is a sad question, who they think is not going to make it out of the cave, if anyone. I know it is a sad question. You know, maybe everyone makes it out fine. Who knows? But for, for those of us just uh, just tuning in who are just huge uh, Chelsea, Woody, and Johnny fans, who who is in the cave right now? Uh, so who is in the cave? Okay, so we have lots of main characters. We have Daryl, Carol, Magna, Aaron, uh, Kelly, Connie, and Jerry. Sweet Jerry. Sweet Jerry. Dog is not in the cave. Dog's not in the cave. Dog is safe at home. Oh, thank God. The group is being led by Baby Coco. <laughs> <laughs> if the group was being led by Judith, they'd be like, everyone gets that okay. 100%. All right. So uh, so we asked you guys to call in and uh, leave us a message about who you think didn't make it. Uh, and by the way, we do tweet out these questions every week. So make sure you check out At The Walking Dead every week. And usually on Monday or Tuesday, we'll tweet out a question. And if you guys want to be part of this podcast, you can call us at 213-536-1275. Okay. So now let's get into these voicemails of who people think did not make it out of the cave. The first one is from Felix. Hello, my name is Felix, and I am from Florence, South Carolina, and my answer is Carol will not leave the cave. Thank you. Goodbye. (laughs) Thank you, Felix. How polite. Short and to the point. You know, I'm from South Carolina. Uh, I mean, I'm from Cleveland, but I grew up in South Carolina, and that's just that that Southern charm. Straight into the point, not meandering on, you know? I mean, he's wrong. He, but... He's probably wrong. There's, like, a part of me that's been thinking Carol could go. Like, what is left for Carol? After all this, she's lost the king. She's lost everyone, Henry, everything. So I, I think they're not going to do it just because fans would be upset, but there could be a chance. All right, on to our next one. Hi, this is Kiana from Patterson, New Jersey. And for who's going to make it out of the cave, I would like to think that everyone is going to make it out, you know, because we love optimism. But if I had to say someone wouldn't make it, I would say maybe Magna or, God forbid, Connie. (laughs) Jerry's too obvious because of the trailer. I think he'll make it out fine. But uh, worrying about Magna, Connie, and Kelly. All right. Thanks, Kiana. Chelsea, Well, I mean, thoughts? you don't have to have all of them. I hope can, not. Can we just have, like, one? I really like the beginning answer of none. Uh, yep. But, I mean, I could see also uh, that whole group has... <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> Nigel, for the last time, bring the tea set after the podcast. What do we pay an authentic British butler for? Decorum, Nigel! I'm sorry that you had to see that. We don't, we don't like to discipline Nigel in front of people. <laughs> Nigel's not making out of the cave, guys. Uh, um, no, and we haven't lost any of that group. So, I mean, it could also be smart that one of those people go because none of that group has lost anyone yet. So, 
they, they have to take their turn. All right, next one is from Mama Deadhead, our favorite. Hey, it's Sarah Large or Mama Deadhead. So the question of the week, who do you think is not coming out of the cave, the same one? I do think that at least one person is going to die because I think that is what is going to change Carol's mind and her way of thinking, make this even more serious. And I think that it is going to be Kelly maybe to project Connie into a further, you know, larger role. But I will tell you one thing. If it is Jerry, I'm just pushing Jerry out of my head because it can't be Jerry. If it's Jerry, I'm going to flip my living room table. I'm going to flip my kitchen table, and I'm going to come to you guys. I'm going to fly all the way there from North Carolina, and I'm going to flip your podcast table. So everyone better hope it's not Jerry. No tables will be safe. Bye, guys. Well, Jokes on Mama Deadhead because our podcast table is bolted down into our perfectly smooth but also soundproof floor. Chelsea, would you say this is the most impressive podcast table and setup you've ever seen? Yeah, no, for sure. It's the most professional I've ever seen or worked with. Um, it, it's really way too heavy to flip. And also, I think we go back to the thing Johnny always says: Why do why do we have to go down? Why do you guys have to go down? Yeah, we. What, what did you guys do? What did we do? Look, we just podcast. We just do subpar jokes and and some lukewarm takes. I don't know why people get so upset about it. Yeah, but. You, you guys work so hard on this podcast studio that honestly, be a shame. It's true. I Thank will you. say, Angela Kane did call me a few months ago and mm-hmm. says, "Hey, we got this cave thing, bunch of characters. Um, who should we kill off?" And I was like, "I don't know, Jerry." And she's like, "Thanks so much." And then she hung up. So I'm not really sure what that means. Johnny, if you are responsible for my sweet sweet Jerry being knocked off this show I'm gonna I'm gonna saran wrap your desk uh, okay well that's that's just a little inconvenient but I mean that's better than you burning the place to the ground like you said you would no that's afterwards what you're gonna saran wrap me to the desk and then burn the place down yes so maybe just you know don't come to work on the Monday after they kill Jerry well we'll see we have Angel Theory coming on for the mid-season premiere episode so that's very exciting who knows what that means Woody what else do we have to look forward to for the podcast. You know, it, it's a busy holiday. Just because all of you get to go see your family and friends doesn't mean that we do. We're going to do, uh, I think next week we're going to have a great holiday gift guide. Uh, I'm, I don't want to hold him to this, but I believe we have Wesley Chu as the special guest who wrote uh, Walking Dead Typhoon. So check that out. That's going to be great. Um, we're going to look forward to uh, Beyond. We're going to look to that. Um, you, wait, are you? we're going to go Beyond Beyond? I don't know if we're going to go Beyond Beyond. I think we're going to probably be in the middle of Beyond. We're going to be Mid Beyond. Mid beyond. And that's that. Yeah, that's it. So we're gonna do that. That's gonna be some point in uh, in December. Um, we're also gonna do a retrospective on the Telltale Walking Dead games. We're also gonna have editor in chief uh, Sean Makowitz is gonna do a complete retrospective on the Walking Dead uh, comics because as you know, those ended this year. All that and much much more is coming up this uh, this hiatus season on Talk Dead to Me. Yeah. Wow. You make it sound so nice. Yeah. It's it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Chelsea, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. It has been a treat. Uh, it's always great when you're around. So thank you so much. Yeah, this um, is great. Oh, I'm like, I'm like checking around. I was so nervous coming in. I was like, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce words correctly. This is gonna be so bad. But no, thank you, you for having me. It's been so fun. You're amazing. And Chelsea, uh, tell the people where they can find you. Um, I'm pretty much who is Chelsea across every platform. I'm really active on Twitter, Twitch, um, Instagram. If you watch uh, any FB, you can actually catch me on there doing some episodes. We uh, actually reacted to The Walking Dead once, so you guys can check that out if you want. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, We will catch you next week. And as always, happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. Do you think he still watches the podcast? Watches the podcast? Yeah. How high are you? you Technically, I'm about, I'm like Nate. Okay. Which is to say, extraordinary.